mercy and peace be to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Schultz and of course we're not having uh, church today because of the snow and the ice and however I'm from Wisconsin. I probably could have driven all the way up there. However, it's the Oklahoma and Kansas drivers that I'm worried about more. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, New Year's resolutions, making New Year's resolutions. I bet you all have a New Year's resolution. You have something about losing weight uh, you can see all the commercials about people resolve to lose weight. And if you go now uh, Monday morning or even this weekend or any time to the, to the workout places, they'll be packed with people who are resolved to lose weight. And they'll probably be there for about a week or two, and then it goes back to the regular people. The, you know, the way they make uh, money on those things is uh, they sell their memberships on uh, the 1st of... Um, of January and then of course then in the middle of May because you want to get your body ready for swimming and things they really don't care if you ever show up because they're getting your money anyway how many of you resolved um, to work less or to work more or to um, you know be with your family more and all sorts of resolutions that can be made and you know, I, I don't know about you, but as, as a sinner and as a, just a regular person, I make all these promises, and then uh, sometimes it seems that I can't uh, fulfill those promises. Uh, but God has some resolutions to tell us today, and I wanted to share with you Numbers 23, uh, verse 19, where it says, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Isn't that great? He's not like us, so if God makes a resolution, it's going to be that uh, he's going to keep that resolution. He's not just a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. You know, I can say I'm going to give up chocolate until I get around some really good chocolate, and then I'm off to the races. Or I'm going to say that I'm changing my mind. I, I'm going to exercise. Well, at least I'm going to, I'm going to lay down until the feeling passes. I've changed my mind there. But it says next, it says, he has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So the first point here is God is making resolutions. And here in Numbers 23 is what he is all about. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? God is faithful, and God will fulfill what he says. So let's take a look at some resolutions that we found in Scripture today. First of all, he is resolved never to leave or forsake us. Never to leave or forsake us. 
He will always be there, no matter what, no matter what tough things are going on. Here's what it says in Hebrews 13. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can the world do to me? What can happen to me that I know that God would never leave me or forsake me? I know sometimes it feels like he's forsaken us, but he's always there. People always say, or some people say, well, where was he when this tragic thing happened? Or where was he when that tragic thing happened? And I believe God was right there, right there, helping the people who were going through such tragedy, who were being killed, who were being murdered, who were being uh, terrorized, to help them through, to know that he will never leave us or forsake us. So that's his first resolution and of course God promises and that's the way it's going to be never to leave or forsake us his next re next resolution resolve to give you a future and a hope give me future and hope in a hopeless world many many people are going without hope they don't think there's anything that could happen to them that would give them hope They're just kind of droning on through life hopeless and giving a future. Turn around and look at some of the kids that are maybe close to you. They have a future. You might not think you have much of a future left, but you do. He says, I resolve to give you a hope and a future. Here's where he says it, Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and hope. Look at that plans for our welfare God does not have plans to give us evil God has plans to give us a future and a hope now let's take a look at those two things isn't that interesting he'll never leave us or forsake us and he gives us a future and hope when I look at the political scene and the world today and I have people I know people uh, some people believe that once you're dead you're dead and there's nothing else and they don't think that life is worth anything. It's just a, a, a fruitless thing. And when it's gone, it's gone. But God says he gives us a future and a hope. And he will never leave us and forsake us. And the next resolution. Resolve to meet our needs. God will meet our needs. Notice it doesn't say he'll meet our wants. Because I've got lots of wants. i got lots of things that I would want. Lots of things. But... The needs, the needs are more important. Philippians 4, 19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Look at that. He provides our needs in Christ Jesus. That's giving us an idea that the biggest need that we have is to have our sins forgiven and know that we have a future and a hope in going to heaven. That's the most important thing there. And God will supply every need of ours according to his riches and his glory in Christ Jesus. Now, there have been times that I've argued with God about this whole business and said, you know, God, I think you should be doing this or I think you should be doing that. And God, it looks like the money's not coming in. And uh, just a while ago, I talked to you about, uh, I don't know if I'm going to have uh, health insurance. And God, are you listening? Are you there? And many times God has uh, uh, put into my mind to look at my stomach. I think I've told you this before, but you know, look at your stomach. Okay, well, I see my stomach. What's the big deal? And he says, have you missed any meals? You know, have you missed any meals? Well, not really. If you take a look at me and my size, you'll know I haven't missed any meals. And he says, well, then be quiet about it. I've got your needs taken care of and you don't have to worry about anything. That gives me hope and that gives me comfort to know that he knows what I need and gives me my needs. Lord, help me to determine and make sure that I know the difference between needs and wants. Next resolution, he's resolved to be our advocate. Yep, one who talks up for us, one who walks in front of us and makes a way for us, one who argues for us. John 2 says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, he doesn't want us to sin, but he knows we're going to sin. And so when we sin, our advocate, Jesus, forgives those sins. He advocates for us in front of the judge and says, Judge, you have to forgive this person. You have to let him go free. I have paid the price for it, see? We have an advocate with the Father. An advocate with the Father. He stands right in front of the Father, the one who has to judge our sin and punish our sin and say, I've taken it on ourselves, myself. The next resolution, resolve to complete a good work in you. You know, I don't know, if you, sometimes you feel useless, like, gosh, why am I here? What am I doing? There's so many people that are so much more talented than me and, and can sing and can uh, preach and can play an instrument and are smart and uh, are artistic and um, are good farmers and good hunters and just good at everything. And when you look at me, I don't think there's there anything really good in me at all. But Philippians uh, 1 verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that he planted a seed of good that he wants you to work. After we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior and he's given us the gift of eternal life and heaven is ours no matter what, we have good works that we need to be doing. We can't just sit around and say, well, I'm saved and that's it. And I'll just wait until I die and I get to go to heaven and I just uh, there's nothing that uh, I really need to do. Well, that's not really true. He has a good work that he wants to complete in you. And here's where we work together with Christ. Here's where we work together with God. We don't work together with God for our salvation. That's done by him. We work together with him now and these good works, this third work of the law, we call it. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder what that good work is in you. I wonder what he's got, what he wants you to try, what he wants you to do. Maybe he wants to stretch you to do something that, gosh, you like to sing, but it's usually in the shower and not in front of anybody else, but now he wants you to be in the choir. Or maybe he wants you to go and care for people that uh, are needy and need your help. Maybe he wants you to help the poor pastor do his secretarial business, his administration business. Oh my goodness, I'm really bad at that. Maybe you are the person that has the good work in you to help to do that. Maybe the good work is to help clean the church. Maybe the good work is to help teach our children, even though you're scared of them. They're just kids, and they can't hurt you very much, I don't think. But we need you, and we need that help. Maybe he's got you to be uh, to help in the, uh, be an elder or be uh, uh, in the church administration. Or maybe it's just mowing the lawn, helping to mow the lawn and keep the place up. Or maybe it's something big, bigger, bigger, bigger than you could ever think of, that I can't even think of. But it's a good work that he's resolved to bring to completion in you. And finally, I think this is the most important one, and it's been throughout everything I've been saying this morning, is resolve to save you. That is God's unswerving purpose all the way through Scripture. And the reason why Jesus Christ came was... Take a look, Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to what? Seek and save the lost. Are you lost? Are you lost today? Are you not sure that if you would die tonight that you'd go to heaven? Or if you were to stand in front of God and he were to say, Why should I let you in? You don't have a good answer? Well, you don't have to be lost anymore. If you were to die tonight, you can go straight to heaven. And if he were to ask you at the gate, why should I let you in? The only answer is, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Jesus Christ purchased my place in heaven. He's going to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter you into the kingdom of heaven. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And maybe the good work that's in you is to seek and to save the lost that are around you. You can't be doing the saving, 
but you can sure point them to the Savior. I would hope that that would happen. Know this, though, that when you blow it, I didn't say if you blow it, I say when you blow it, that he is there to forgive, to be your advocate, to give you peace, to give you strength, to pick you up, to dust you off, and lift you up, and help you to go on. May God grant it to you and to me and to all of us as we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now the peace that passes all understanding. Keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.